So diabetes is a cluster of metabolic conditions, all characterized by hyperglycemia or raised blood glucose levels. This occurs in the face of absolute or relative insulin deficiency. Insulin is the key hormone secreted by the pancreas that uh, modifies uh, uh, glucose levels in, in the blood. And glucose has to be kept within a very tight range too high and we get complications related to the metabolic effects of glucose, particularly in the small vessels of the body, the eyes and the feet, and, and also the large vessels like uh, it, uh, the heart itself. Too low and we get problems of, uh, of low glucose related to, to, to problems in the brain. So it's kept in a very tight homeostatic uh, range. And when this gets out of control to the high level, that is what the problem of diabetes is. Now, until um, the early part of the, the 20th century, all diabetes was considered to be the same. In fact, it comes from a Greek word, meaning diabetes means uh, siphon. And that, it's, it's used, that term is used because it's characterized by f excess of urine and uh, too much uh, water flowing out of the body uh, as a consequence of the high glucose levels. And the other word is mellitus, meaning sweet. So originally the diagnosis was made by characterizing the urine as tasting sweet because glucose was lost in the urine. And in the early part of the 20th century, our understanding of diabetes changed when insulin was discovered by Banting and Best in Canada, for which they won the Nobel Prize. And shortly afterwards, it became possible to measure insulin. And thereafter, it was possible to distinguish between people who had a form of insulin uh, deficiency which gave rise to diabetes as opposed to another group of people who had very high levels of insulin and appeared to be resistant to its effects and this led to a distinction between type 1 diabetes which is a disorder that characteristically comes on in young people has an acute onset and is, is due to uh, uh, absolute deficiency of insulin by, by the pancreas and the other form of diabetes to which we give the label type 2 diabetes, which tends to be more insidious, comes on slowly in mid to late life, uh, and is associated with relative deficiency of insulin, but absolute problems of, of insulin resistance at the end organs. And those organs are the, the skeletal muscle, uh, and the adipose tissue, and the liver. Now, type 2 diabetes, because it comes on slowly, can be present in people for many years before it comes to clinical recognition. And this gives rise to considerations of whether or not we should be screening for diabetes in populations, which is currently an unresolved question. But clinically, uh, our priorities are to reduce the blood uh, glucose levels and make people more sensitive to insulin. We have a range of therapies that, that do that, some of them oral, uh, and some of them, on occasions, it's necessary to, uh, to uh, supplement that with injection of insulin to try and overcome the, the relative deficiency of insulin. And our priority in care is to reduce the, the uh, long-term complications of the condition. Now, if you take a step back from that clinical perspective and try and place diabetes in a global perspective, there are some 400 million people with diabetes around the world, 80% of them live in low and middle income countries. And these are countries with poor uh, availability of healthcare systems. So I think globally, we've got a major challenge because in addition to those 400 million people, there's something like half a billion people who are at risk of diabetes. So there's a major uh, scientific challenge about where we put our priorities, how we improve systems of care for the people who have the condition now, and ensure that people around the world have access to simple, uh, efficacious therapies, and also how we put in place systems for screening and prevention of diabetes at the population level. We also have to invest in trying to improve diabetes care, and that's in two ways. We have to get better systems of care, because the, the real uh, cornerstone of therapy is to have uh, registers of people with diabetes, to ensure that people are recalled annually to have checks of simple parameters to determine who's at risk, to measure their blood pressure, their cholesterol, and a measure of their hyperglycemia, the HbA1c, and then to act to keep those in, in, in check.
and also to check for the presence of complications uh, by examination of the, the evidence of peripheral neuropathy in the feet, examination of the retina to detect diabetic retinopathy. And by putting in place systems of care, we know that that can result in improved uh, outcomes. In, a in conjunction with that, however, we have to continually seek to try and uh, to try and get better therapies. One of the problems with diabetes is that we have some therapies, metformin, sulfonylurea agents, GLP-1 agonists, other classes of drugs. Individually, they're not uh, very effective, and we have to search to find uh, newer therapies that can uh, reduce the blood glucose and ideally not result in weight gain at the same time. Yeah, in the past, the diagnosis of diabetes uh, classically was based on an oral glucose tolerance test. This is a challenge test. Uh, the patient comes along fasted, having had an overnight fast, and then they're given a blood sample of fasting and then given a challenge of 75 grams of anhydrous glucose in a drink and the blood glucose is then measured again at two hours. And the criteria for diabetes were based both on the fasting and the two-hour blood samples. These were the classical ways of diagnosing diabetes and were used uh, predominantly in epidemiological studies to define the prevalence of diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes. The challenge was they weren't used very much in clinical practice because it's a laborious, time-consuming test. The person has to come along in a specialized state and they have to stay for the whole morning to have the test. So there was a big gulf between what was used in epidemiology and science and what was used in clinical practice, particularly for the, making the diagnosis in, in the asymptomatic individual. In somebody who has symptoms, uh, it's, it's easy to make the diagnosis of diabetes. But as we uh, focused our attention more on people who were asymptomatic, this gulf between clinical practice and scientific practice got wider and wider. So um, the HbA1c is a, another test that has recently been adopted for the diagnosis of diabetes. So glycosylated hemoglobin is a way of measuring uh, an integrated sum of somebody's glucose levels for the preceding two months. So hemoglobin uh, levels get affected by ambient glucose levels in the blood, and as red cells live for 120 days, the, the, the proportion of a hemoglobin that's in the form A1C, which is glycosylated, is an average indicator of what the glucose levels have been for the preceding two months. This measure is a good indicator of how somebody has been controlling their diabetes. It's a good measure of how they respond to therapy and it predicts complications. So uh, in the early part of the 2000s, it became evident that this was a measure that could be used for the diagnosis of diabetes. This was originally proposed by the American Diabetes Association and then adopted by the World Health Organization. So it's perfectly possible to have biochemical diabetes for many years before it becomes clinically apparent. Um, one can have uh, glucose levels that are above the diagnostic range for diabetes and have no symptoms whatsoever. Until recently, it was estimated that of all the people who had diabetes, type 2 diabetes, roughly half of them were actually not clinically diagnosed. And if you went to a population and looked for those people, with a, with a diagnostic test, you could find that they had the condition but were unaware of it. It's only relatively late in the process of diabetes that you get any symptoms, uh, such as thirst, polyuria, polydipsia. Uh, and uh, the, the, the feeling is that uh, if by detecting diabetes earlier, we could institute therapy earlier, that we could actually uh, improve, uh, improve outcomes. That is uh, an assumption and it's very difficult to test because it would require a randomized controlled trial. But there is fairly good evidence now to suggest that we should be picking up diabetes earlier, particularly in this phase where it's prevalent but hasn't been diagnosed. If one looks around the world at the prevalence of diabetes, you see a marked variation between populations. So it is very common in certain uh, ethnic groups who have undergone rapid industrialization and westernization, particularly common in some Native American people in, in, South, in some South Pacific populations.
It's also extremely rare in some other populations. And this has given rise to hypotheses about why type 2 diabetes might uh, originate. And one of those hypotheses is called the thrifty genotype hypothesis, which suggests that some populations, particularly those that have had periods of food scarcity and food abundance, have been enriched with a gene that might uh, give rise to a survival advantage in the times of food scarcity, but then might become detrimental in the times of food abundance. Uh, the idea is that that gene, which would be thrifty, allow you to uh, conserve energy very efficiently, would be then uh, detrimental in times of, uh, of, of, of wide food availability. So this thrifty genotype hypothesis has been around for 50 years. The big question that's unanswered is what is the molecular basis for this? Because we have no direct evidence of any uh, genes that interact in this way that give rise to susceptibility to diabetes that only becomes manifest under certain environmental circumstances. And really finding that, if it exists, uh, is a major challenge.